Um, yeah, let's pray. Father God, we just come this morning and we're thankful for Keith and Aaron and their heart for orphans and pray that our ears would be attentive to what you want to do in our hearts. You are attentive to the needs of the, of the widows and of the orphans, as James 1.27 says. You are attentive to us, weak, sinful people. You love us. You showed up. Everything's different because you showed up, God. And you walked among us, and not only that, you died to redeem us and set us free. And we pray right now that you'd speak to us. We want to meet with you. We tend to be very dull of hearing, and we want to be open and receptive. We want to, uh, our hearts to be stirred, our minds to be filled with your wonder and your awe and your greatness. Jesus, you are the reason that we are here. You are the reason we exist. You're the reason we celebrate, and we want to make this all about you, because indeed, the entire universe is about you and your glory. We thank you for this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, we're back in our study of Proverbs this morning, and we're talking about uh, sowing a counterculture. That is, God intends for us to put on display what He's like. That His grace, forgiveness, and love, that our lives are more and more becoming like Jesus, and the people around us are blessed by that. And that our families are blessed by that and that we become attractional to the people around us, they can look at our lives and go, wow, I want that. And whether they accept our God or not, they may even be hostile towards the gospel, that they would look at our lives and go, there's something radically different. There's something really good there. There's something I wish I had. And Proverbs is about sowing a counterculture. It's about living as kingdom citizens with a new king, with a new citizenship, and a new ethic and a new morality. And that's what God wants for us. Because he wants us to embrace Jesus, to embrace the fullness of his love, grace, and forgiveness, and then to live that for others to see and experience. And this goes back to the heart. We looked at last week in Proverbs. We've been looking at some of these huge issues that Proverbs deals with. And we said that if God gives you a new heart, and that's what Ecclesiastes, or Ezekiel, I'm sorry, 36, 26 says, that God gives us a new heart. When God gives you a new heart by faith, he gives you the opportunity, he makes it possible for you to fear God. And then, the new heart, making it possible to fear God, fear God makes it possible to get wisdom. And so we're moving along this week, last week we looked at the heart, this week we're going to look at the results of the heart, the opportunity to fear God, a topic that is very unfun to deal with, the fear of God. Um... And yet, God seems to take that to be a very important issue. And we typically think of these nut jobs carrying signs, picketing at uh, funerals and in other places, uh, claiming to be on God's side, really being very hateful uh, towards others. And we go, man, they seem to talk about fear of God all the time. And so in addition to that, in fact, into a re reaction to that, mostly uh, we talk about God's love. But we really need to understand ourselves in light of God that we're called to love and fear God and what that means and what that looks like. To, to lay just a little more foundation for this book, this book was written by King Solomon, son of the great King David. His mother was Bathsheba, who David took as his wife after killing her husband. You would think that would play a little more role in Solomon's life than it seems to, to play. Um... But Solomon goes on to write nearly 3,000 Proverbs. And he writes in this book, of, the book of Proverbs, to kids. You don't have to have a doctor to get wisdom. It's written to simple people who want to live simple lives of faith and just love Jesus. It's a simple book. Now, one of the interesting questions that arises is, if Solomon was so wise, how did he end up with over 700 wives and like 300 plus girlfriends? You know, that is kind of an interesting question, isn't it? Um, he seems to get wisdom when God comes to him and says, what do you want? He says, I want wisdom. God says, I'll give you wisdom. I'll give you everything else as well. Then he gets proud of his wisdom and his wealth, turns away from God, spends a large portion of his life being very unwise, being very foolish, only to repent in Ecclesiastes as an old man, broken over having squandered away his life. What we want to do is we want to gain wisdom. And there's much to be gained through wisdom. And here's why God wants you this morning 
to fear him and to gain wisdom is because wisdom has storehouses of all the good. We're going to see that through Proverbs, that he intends to open those storehouses and to bless you. And that comes through the fear of the Lord. And so if you'll turn with me to Proverbs, if you've brought your Bibles, chapter 1, or you can just listen. Proverbs chapter 1, we're going to read verses 1 through 7. We're going to land on 7. We're going to kind of uh, unpack that verse a little bit. He says this, Proverbs 1, 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to discern the sayings of understanding, to receive instruction in wise behavior, righteousness, justice, and equity, to give prudence to the naive, to the youth, knowledge, and discretion. A wise man will hear and increase in learning, and a man of understanding will acquire wise counsel to understand a proverb and a figure, the words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord, verse 7, is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. <clears throat> According to verse 7, being on God's team, living the life God called us to live, takes more than just believing, doesn't it? In fact, an element of belief is the fear of the Lord. James 2, in the New Testament, he says, talking on faith in 2.19, he says that, James says, even the demons believe and shudder in fear at God. And yet it's not a salvific type of fear or belief. They're not saved. In fact, it's not a worshipful fear. But rather, what Proverbs 1.7, in tying it with the whole of Scripture, what we see is, Belief in God is to be coupled with an authentic fear of God, and that it implies that. Um, so there's an appropriate and a worshipful fear that should accompany genuine faith. We were designed by God not only to love Him, but also to fear Him. And, and a key to that in, in this verse, he says, the fear of the Lord, is understanding that word Lord which we struggle to understand in our democratic minds where we can vote in and out all of those who are in authority over us. We struggle with authority in a big way. But what Proverbs and the whole of Scripture is constantly pointing us to is the greatness, the height, how big and how other God is, that He indeed is Lord, that He runs the show, that everything is His. He owns it all. He made it all. He ultimately, this is all His. It's His world. And Lord was someone who had the rightful ownership, whether it be over homes or land or over peoples, like a king would be a Lord. And people were to submit and to surrender to their authority. Otherwise, there were some pretty significant and serious consequences. Take a little a small picture. If, if I were to come to your home and to visit your home, and as I'm visiting, I started to go, hey, I don't like that picture. I think I'll just take that picture down and get rid of it. Oh, I think we'll move around the, the furniture and... If I just started to take over and go, hey, oh, by the way, I think I'll stay here tonight. You can sleep on the porch. I'll take your room. You start to go, wait a minute. This is my home. It's my rules. I set it up my way, and you would immediately be offended because that was your home. And I don't come into your home and tell you how to run your home. I would just be a guest there. This is God's world. So he calls the shots. He's the Lord. He owns it all. He's the reason your heart pumps blood and your lungs breathe this morning. He calls the shots. Amen, I like that. I like all this amen, man. He's doing an awesome job on amen. Um, and so, in the Old Testament, when you see Lord, you can import Jesus, because that's biblical who we're talking about. When you track through the Old Testament, and he says, Lord, Lord, it's Jesus that they're talking about. But the idea of fearing God is complicated. It, it includes respect, reverence, awe, wonder, and even terror. Isaiah, in Isaiah 6, sees God's glory, and he says, Woe is me, for I am ruined. And he just immediately realizes, he says, I'm a man of unclean lips, in a people of unclean lips, and he sees the, the greatness of the glory of the Lord, and he goes, I'm ruined. He's so holy and so high and so exalted. And we need that picture. If we're to fear God, we need a big picture of God. For the person who fears God, they have, a, they have a high and exalted view of him, and it'll change your entire life. And as you begin to submit to him as Lord, you'll gain wisdom. The fool does just the opposite. The person with the low view of God is called a fool, and he says there's no fear of God before their eyes, Romans 3.8. The fool has no fear of God. I would contend that in our day, this is a very significant issue. I can't speak for 
everywhere, but at least in the Western church, it seems like the fear of God is something that we don't deal with very much. It's something we don't tend to think on. People tend to have, in our day, a very high view of themselves and their opinions, or the opinions of men, period, and a very low esteem of God and his opinions in the Word of God. And we tend to have a very lopsided view of God so that we focus almost exclusively on his love, and we almost totally neglect the idea of fearing God but what happens is we create a God in our minds and we create a God that fits our perceptions of how we think he should be. And the Bible calls that idolatry. It's a picture of God that doesn't correspond to reality. We make up a God in our minds who's much smaller than the real God, who's much less frightening and much less powerful than the real God. And we do that so that we can esteem ourselves and value ourselves and feel good about ourselves. And whether it's Rob Bell at the huge Bible church up in Michigan and his sort of universalistic mindset of no hell for people, and, or whether it's some of the uh, current trends in Christianity, the views, the theolo theological views that somehow God has no control, or can, doesn't know the future, or has no control over human history, whatever it may be, these things do not align with the reality of God in the Bible. And yet, it's very uh, popular to sort of take a Luby's type of view of God. You go through the cafeteria you, you style thing where you pick this and you pick that and you leave this and you leave that and, and you come out and you come to your checkout counter and you, get, you, you pay for your meal. We do that with God. We go, I like this, I don't like that, I like this, I don't care for that. And we make a God in our own imaginations that fits our own perceptions rather than going to the Word. And that's why we, we take the Bible very lightly and we take men's opinions very seriously. But God rebuked the Israelites for that very thing. In Isaiah 40, verse 20, 21, he says, You thought that I was just like you. You thought that I was just like you. This isn't a new trend. Man has, mankind has always done this. Create a God of our own imagination, of our own liking, and what do we do? We tack Jesus on and we worship it. Right? That, that's idolatry. Um, and it will destroy your life rather than bless your life. What you and I need to do is come to the scripture and say, what, who is God? What is he like? It doesn't have to be something I like. It just matters what reality is. What is God like? And then I'll worship him for that because this is his world and I'm created by him and that's what I was designed to do, to fear him and love him. And I just want to know what he's like. And so the first thing I want to show you is that there's a cause and effect relationship between your view of God and your life. There's an immediate, there's, there's an absolute connection between how you view God and your life. Proverbs 1, verse 9, 29 to 31. It says this, Proverbs 1, starting verse 29. Because they hated knowledge and did not choose the...